You can hear me. Okay. Phew. I got so excited. I was like, oh, no, no one can hear me. Oh, my gosh. Okay. This is so exciting. Um, I have had this idea for a while to do some webinars at night or on the trainer or are just sitting at home in their Norma Tech pants. And I have really felt like there was a... Um, a place for this in the triathlon market. So I put it out there and a ton of you responded back and were like, heck yes, we want to hear what you have to say about willpower. So that's exciting to me. Um, a few details. All of you are muted, but you can hear me and you can see me. Um, I'm probably going to talk to myself or maybe the camera. You can chat in the chat box down on the lower left. Um, and during that, Troy is sitting over here and he's kind of watching that chat. So if you have questions or comments or you want to talk to other people, um, go ahead and just get that chat going. I'm not going to look at it at all. So if you want to chat while I'm talking, go for it. I'm all for it. Um, also, I'll be sending out a recording of this webinar afterwards. So if I end up talking really fast, which I probably will, or um, I just skip through something that's confusing. You guys will be able to go through that again. Um, Troy, I'm going to have you go ahead and moderate my phone. All right. Willpower. Oh, my gosh. When I got into the research for willpower, it was insane. Insane. So, all right. I'm just going to get started, and uh, I'll do a little introduction in a second, but I first, um, I want to at least let you know what you're here for. So first of all, I have a little bit of a confession. I've given quite a few talks on willpower, routines, habits, life hacks, like how to get the most out of yourself as an endurance athlete, um, and I've been doing a lot of speaking lately, and one, one thing that I've been closing with is that willpower is bullshit um, and that routines are king and I have a little bit of a confession because as I went through the research on willpower for this talk I realized willpower isn't bullshit um, willpower is actually a superpower that we all have and I don't think a lot of us are really harnessing it's not a superpower like Superman or like any of the Avengers it's a superpower more like Batman and I'm going to talk a lot about that at the end of, of my little talky-talky here. But just think, not Superman, Batman. All right. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to go through three basic things. One, what is willpower? There's three main parts. Um, and I really do want to discuss them in depth because they've really given me a lot of insight. Then I'm going to go a little bit into the brain science. Um, I'm not a brain scientist. I'm just a girl who reads a lot and does some triathlons. So I'm not going to get overly technical on the brain science, but I am going to highlight some stuff that I want you to think about. And we're going to do it in story format. Um, and we're going to try to keep it super fun because that would get really boring. Uh, and then finally, we are going to talk about my Batman model for willpower. Because um, I think Batman's awesome. And I think that we're all kind of him. So. That's what we're going to go through today. Let's, um, oh yeah, before we get started, a little bit about me. If you don't know me, I'm looking down the participant list here, and it gets me like really excited um, because there's so many of you that I do know, and you, sh you showed up to listen to me talk on a Monday night, but there are a few of you I don't know. So if you came here via Facebook or um, someone shared this with you, I'm a triathlete. I'm an amateur triathlete, and I'm a coach. I recently founded a coaching company called Rising Tide Triathlon Coaching, and our main goal is to create community balance and fun within the triathlon community, all the while kicking ass. Um, so I really wanted to, to start offering some, some different things and products out there that aren't on the market that create community. Personally, um, I'm a 13-time Iron Distance Ironman finisher. I've been to Kona five times in a row. Um, I put the wooden bowl right there last year from Kona. I got second in my age group. Um, and I've been on a huge journey through this sport. 
when I started my coaching company, I really had to look at what I had to offer the triathlon community. Um, and I knew it wasn't going to be optimal um, swim form training. You can go somewhere else for that. I knew it wasn't going to be like the perfect set on your bike to maximize FTP. Um, although I know a lot about that stuff, where my wheelhouse really is, is the, the stuff up here and how to translate it into the body. So that that body kinesthetic with the mental connection that we have. I knew that that was what where I needed to share what I've learned through the last eight years um, of triathlon. So with that in mind, let's go ahead. Let's dive in. Let's look at willpower. Okay. Willpower is actually, there's three parts of willpower. Um, and our prefrontal cortex, which is our forehead right here, is where all of our willpower and self-control is housed. This is a more modern portion of our brain, and by modern, I mean it's not our primitive uh, inner brain. It's actually a more modern social part of our brain. It's been getting bigger through um, the thousands of years that we've been adapting as anthropology that our, our front skull has been kind of bulging out. Um, so we have three parts of willpower. Let's go through them. One, aptly named, it is your I will. And this is actually housed on the upper left portion of your prefrontal cortex up here. And now your I will is really responsible for the ability to do what you need to do, even if part of you doesn't want to do it. Um, so this area is responsible for us starting and sticking to stupid or boring stuff. Uh, example, you're on the treadmill. You're kicking butt, and then you're not kicking butt, and then you don't really want to be on the treadmill, and then you kind of want to get off and take a shower, but you don't. Something in you stops you, right? Like, you don't. You stay on the treadmill, and you tell yourself, no, I have to stay on the treadmill. I have to finish my workout. That's your willpower, and that's happening up in your upper left. Your upper right is actually your won't power. So when you have trouble saying no, because some part of you, may it be your stomach or your heart, um, says, yes, please, that is actually your won't power. And that's housed on the upper right side of your prefrontal cortex. This side holds you back from cravings and impulses. Um, this is the side that's responsible for you making the decision to not text and drive, right? So when you, when you have the call like, oh, I should text, I should pick up my phone, and then you say, no, don't do that. I know that's bad. That's actually the won't power. And that's a different side of your brain than the I will power. So our will, our I will and our I won't are actually responsible for what we do. Um, but there's a third part that I really want you guys to think about. And that is, if you look, it's right in here on our brain. And that's our I want power. So our I want area of our prefrontal cortex actually decides when you use your willpower and when you use your won't power. So when you say no to something or when you say yes to something and your ability to remember what you really, really want. So this is where our goals and our desires live in our brain. There's a um, prominent um, brain neurologist, a neurobiologist at Stanford. His name is Robert Sapolsky. And he thinks the prefrontal cortex, it's our friend, and he says that the main job of our modern prefrontal cortex is to bias the brain towards doing the hard thing. So this is literally where we do the hard things. So this is, this part of our brain lights up in MRI when we're on the couch and we decide to go exercise. Boom, prefrontal cortex. When we see dessert and we want to say yes, but instead we make a cup of tea. Boom, prefrontal cortex. All right. Also, note that if we don't wear our helmet and we crash our bike, this is what we're going to take out. So important to keep the prefrontal cortex safe. When I think of prefrontal cortex, um, I started looking a little more into I will, I won't, and this concept of de decision fatigue kept coming up. I don't know if anyone has heard of decision fatigue. If you've heard of decision fatigue, I want you to say yes in the chat box. I'm going to wait. Waiting. Yesing. Knowing. 
people are typing. Yes, decision fatigue. You know it. Whoop, whoop. Husband listening. Yes, decision fatigue. Okay. So decision fatigue is this concept that we only have this finite power of decision making capabilities. So if we like go through our day and we we have to make all these decisions, it's a really active day and we're at work and we're telling people to do this and that and make that blue and have this for lunch, that we will just run out of this willpower to make decisions. So they've done a lot of research on this. It's a really common thing. And the, bio, the neurobiologists actually disagree. Some have done research and proved, yes, we definitely have this decision fatigue. And some have picked apart that research and said, um, your research is superficial. So when they've done decision fatigue research, um, they do a lot of things like they put M&Ms and chocolate chip cookies in front of people and tell them they can't have any, that they have to resist it and have willpower. And then they test them at a later date. Um, and they take two control groups and they do this willpower test on them later. And they find that if you had to resist M&Ms and cookies earlier, you're more likely to have less willpower later in the day. So I wanted to share with you the classic test that they use for self-control because I think it's hilarious and important. The classic test for self-control is they, they get a bucket of ice cold water and you have to put your hand in it. And when you pull your hand out is when you fail the test. So these poor people literally like get sit in a, in a room and told not to eat the cookies and then get taken into another room and told to put their hand in this cold bucket of water. And then they test how quickly they take it out or don't take it out. So they've found with those tests that yes, we have this decision fatigue thing. But what a lot of the other neurobiologists are saying uh, who study willpower are that these tests are superficial. And when it comes to our I want power, which means when we attach our willpower to our deepest held beliefs and goals, we don't have decision fatigue. We don't get tired when we align what we want with what we deeply believe. So I thought when I was discussing, thinking of deciding to discuss decision fatigue or not, I just thought it was really important because as I coach athletes, I often ask them, why do you want to do an Ironman? Why do you want, why do you want to qualify? Um, and a lot of times it's like, I don't know, or they can't really come up with it. And I know that that's from self-experience. I know that that's because these goals really are a multi-sensory experience. And we really anticipate feeling these deep, um, these deep, feelings of good and accomplishment, et cetera. Um, but we very can't often tap into what it is inside of us that we really deeply want and why we want it. And if you are struggling with willpower, that is one thing I want you to really take a look at. Do you really understand your why? And can you attach your why to those moments that you're trying to decide to get to sleep on time or to wake up early or to do that one last set of 200s in the pool? Can you attach it to your deepest why? If you can, you're probably gonna have a better chance at maintaining your willpower. If you can't, you're probably gonna experience decision fatigue. Boom, okay, next slide. All right, okay, brain science. Okay, without getting too crazy, I'm gonna go through two situations, um, only because I think that they're really interesting, really interesting, hopefully you agree. First situation, you're riding along on your bike. I know everyone's been in this situation and something happens like a car pulls in front of you or they pass really close or maybe they swerve or something happens to where you think you're about to get hit. Um, I want you to just kind of go there in your mind a little bit and think about what goes on. So our amygdala, is our primal brain. It sits deep inside, deep, deep inside there. It's not here. This is our logic, our prefrontal cortex. Our amygdala is deep inside. It's responsible for quick impulses. It's our primitive brain. It's interested in safety, instant gratification, laziness to some extent, sometimes when it makes sense. This amygdala is what lights up when we get into one of those situations on our bike. And what, what happens is this term that we've all heard so many times called the fight or flight response, right? 
we have this fight, flight, or freeze response that happens. Cortisol is pumped through our system. That's going to jack us up, adrenaline. Our pupils are actually going to dilate. Our ears are going to become really sensitive to sound. Our heart rate is going to increase like mine is right now because I'm talking to people on a webinar. Um, and the glycogen in our blood is going to start getting used right away really quickly for fuel. And we've all heard those stories of people who do miraculous things when they're put in an instantaneous fight or flight response. People who chuck people up into trees or push cars off of their mother-in-law or you name it. We've all heard of this. But what I want you to think about really quickly is what part of your brain does not fire during this situation? I think you can guess it. It's our prefrontal cortex. So our prefrontal cortex, when we are in a place of fight or flight or a cortisol situation or stress response, our prefrontal cortex shuts down. Um, and that is a very biological response because we cannot be expected to take time to think logically in these situations. We simply don't have time. So our brain, being so smart, shuts off that part so that we are sure to act impulsively. We want to act impulsively in those moments. Okay, I want you to also notice from this situation of the potential bike crash that this car was an external impulse that came into our brain, right? We visualized an external impulse or threat. Now I want you to feast your eyes on this beautiful photo of cheesecake that I found. Let's think about cheesecake. Let's think about cheesecake. Been training all day, had a couple sessions, out for a stroll on the town with your family. You see a bakery, what's in the window? Cheesecake. Suddenly you find yourself taking a few steps closer to said cheesecake, opening the door to the cafe, and all of a sudden you find yourself at the cheesecake. The same part of your brain that initiates your fight or flight response actually just lit up to this cheesecake because the cheesecake initiated your promise, promise of reward center. This is a very deep biological center that we have. When we were out traipsing around the savanna, not the savanna, maybe somewhere with bushes, and we happened upon some strawberries, the promise of reward took us to those strawberries in a very primal way. When you see that cheesecake, you actually um, are drawn to it with your amygdala before your prefrontal cortex can even catch up. Your blood sugar, it starts a physiological response. Your blood sugar drops when it sees sweet things because it knows you're going to eat them and it needs your blood sugar to be lower so that it can eat them. That's a physiological response that happens primally. Um, your mouth waters just from seeing something, right? Because your mouth needs to get ready to salivate and to break down all of the sugar that you're about to eat. So your mouth waters, your blood sugar drops. These happen right away. But get this, and this is the really cool thing. Your brain knows that cheesecake requires an internal response, whereas an automobile about to hit you requires an external response. And I think this is the craziest part because when you're, even though the same spots in your brain are lighting up, your brain knows that in the cheesecake situation, it needs to send blood to your prefrontal cortex. And it does this through what they call the pause and plan response. So if you do find yourself inside that cafe, have you ever noticed that you don't walk up to the counter and go, I need cheesecake right now. Here's my money. Stat. You don't have a quick response. What do you do? You look around. Cheesecake. Oh, chocolate mousse. Oh, that, that carrot cake looks really good. You actually will always, your brain will require that you take a pause and plan so that your prefrontal cortex can catch up because your brain knows that this is an internal response that you have to deal with rather than an external response. Um, so when we think about, I hit a button. When we think about how our brain's responding um, in context of triathlon, I want you to think about external responses versus internal responses. And I want you to understand that you have two brains at work, that amygdala and that prefrontal cortex, and they really act as a system of checks and balances. Um, 
Through evolution, our prefrontal cortex actually developed as a system of band-aids and patches. So when we were in the cave, we want to eat all the antelope that just got killed. But if we eat all the antelope, the other people in the cave aren't going to like us because we ate all their food. So we actually developed a little bit of prefrontal cortex to stop ourselves and say, don't eat all the antelope, save some for Julie, because I'd like to hook up with her later. Um, we developed that logic side. Well, as things went on and our social circumstances and situations became more elaborate, our prefrontal cortex had to keep up. So we kept creating patches and patches and patches and layers and layers on top of our prefrontal cortex. So when you think about it, your primal brain is not bad. It's there for important reasons. And your prefrontal cortex has really developed over time to make sure that you have checks and balances that are in line with what society is asking of you today. And that's where I kind of start thinking about Batman. Um, Batman. So Batman, he wasn't born with any special talents. Neither are you, neither are I. We're all pretty much the same. We have some differences and those differences are really, really important. And that's something I wanna go into future webinars with is our differences and how they make us important and how we can be successful with our differences. But we are kind of all the same. We all have these great, highly developed brains um, that are very patterned to understand the tasks of willpower. My Batman model for understanding your willpower and managing it. So now that you have this concept that your brain is, is a set of checks and balances, it's ready to work really hard for you. Let's go ahead and look at some of why we still get into trouble. Um, we highlighted a little bit on it coming down to our deepest wants and desires. That's somewhere that we get in trouble. Uh, but let's go through my Batman model. Okay. So one, preoccupation. Um, let's see. I have this study. Students trying to remember a telephone number. They did this study. This is like one of my faves. Okay. So students trying to remember a telephone number are 50% more likely to choose chocolate cake over fruit at a snack cart. So if your brain is preoccupied, you're 50% more less likely to make a good decision when it comes to food. Preoccupation is huge. Um, and this great book on willpower by Kelly McGonigal, she has this great quote that says, when your mind is preoccupied, your impulses, your amygdala, not your long-term goals right here, will guide your choices. So what can we do about preoccupation? I think this is something we're all dealing with. We have really busy lives. And when it comes to triathlon, most of us are entering into our training session with some sort of preoccupation. If you want the willpower portion of your brain to be firing on all cylinders, you have to take time to let go of the preoccupation that you're walking into your training with. Many people use training as stress relief. If you're using it for stress relief, you shouldn't be using it um, as training for huge goals. If you wanna get the most out of your willpower and you have intervals to do, and this is an important workout and it means a lot to you and your goals, you need to make sure that preoccupation isn't following you into your sessions. So how I do that is um, I have a simple grounding that I do. I do it every session because I, I'm running around with a lot. We all are. Um, I do it in my warm up, and we all have warm ups, whether it's swimming, biking, running, we all have that time. And there's a reason, right? Our body needs to get ready for the effort that we're going to ask of it to do. Your mind needs to get ready for the effort that you're going to ask of it to do. And your glutes and your quads and your transverse abdominals or your lats need to work hard for you, your brain needs to work hard for you. So you wouldn't want your body to have to be preoccupied, right? You wouldn't try to like be knitting and then also be swimming. You want to make sure that your brain has all the chance to put towards. So I do what's called a grounding. It only takes one minute. I close my eyes if I'm in the pool, if I'm running, try not to run into anything. Um, or I just kind of focus on an object and I envision my thoughts moving back up and over the top of my head, back down the back of my head into my spinal column, 
down into my chest where my heart is, and I deliver my thoughts into my heart. Now, I deliver my thoughts into my heart because that's where they work best, and that's where they get sorted out without me obsessing and thinking over them. You can put your thoughts wherever you want. The, the main thing is that you have a practice that you start to develop where you are consciously removing your thoughts and preoccupation and putting them somewhere else. They can go like out your fingertips. They can go like down at your feet and be grounded into the soil. Really what matters is that you take time to handle and deal with your preoccupations before training. Okay, so preoccupation, part one of the Batman model. Get rid of it. Be Batman. Utilize your resources. Two, stress management. Um, it's such a buzzword, stress and cortisol, blah, blah, blah. We're all under it. But I, and there are many try hacks that we can talk about relating to balance, routine, um, meditation, which we'll talk about, doing fun things, et cetera, et cetera. We'll go into all that at a later point. But the main thing I want you to understand is that when your fight or flight response is constantly tapped, what is shutting off your prefrontal cortex, where your willpower is stored, where your self-control lives. So stress management and finding a way to shut down that fight or flight response is the, is you just don't want to hinder your prefrontal cortex's ability to be utilized. So stress management, think about that. How stressed am I going into a session? How likely am I to make a bad choice right now that's not in alignment with my goals because I'm stressed out and I'm shutting off my prefrontal cortex? Is there a way that I can calm, simmer, do something, go through some, kiss your children, create some sort of happy dopamine in your system, listen to some comedy, something to allow that fight or flight to calm down so that your decision-making, a willpower part of your brain can heighten back up. Stress management. Meditation. You knew I was going to go to meditation. If anyone follows me on Facebook or Twitter or they come to my house to stay with me for a while, you know um, that meditation was probably the reason that I have a wooden bowl sitting behind me. Um, the major change I made between 2013 and 2014 was to start a meditation practice because a sports psychologist told me I had to. So what does meditation do? The crazy thing about meditation is that it increases blood flow to our prefrontal cortex. It also increases blood flow to the parts of our brain that house self-control, attention, focus, stress management, impulse control, and self-awareness. When we meditate, we actually increase the density of our gray matter in our prefrontal cortex. And they have measured this on MRIs. It only takes 11 hours of meditation for them to be able to measure in an MRI the density changes in your prefrontal cortex. The problem is meditation is a ginormous pain in the butt. You want to get up and get going. You're ready. Oh, now you need to meditate. Um, I get a lot of when I'm talking to my athletes about meditation, I suck at meditation. I can't quiet my brain. I, you know, I don't have time. There's a great quote that says, if you don't have time for 10 minutes of meditation, you need an hour. Um, the best way I can describe meditation for athletes, and this will be a whole nother webinar, is that the worse, the better. Meditation is not the quieting of the mind. That's like every once in a while you happen upon that really good training day where you're like, I'm on fire. Like I can do no wrong today. And we all hope that happens on race day and it like never does. But maybe once in a while we just have that great day. That the same thing happens in meditation. Every once in a while we have this great day and we don't really have a lot of thoughts and we're all blissed out and we get up and we're just so ready to conquer the world. But 99% of days, you basically are like, when's this going to end? Back to my breath. I'm hungry. Back to my breath. Oh, my knee hurts. Back to my breath. Meditation stinks most of the time because we, we don't actually think about it in the right way. 
as an athlete, you would not expect to go out and have perfect sessions every day, right? You want the struggle because what happens with struggle? Adaptation, right? We have to struggle in order to adapt. And it's the same with meditation. We're never hoping to just be blissed out in every meditation. What we're hoping is that we think everything under the moon because that's really going to work our brain at releasing thought, releasing thought, releasing thought. Um, so meditation builds up the prefrontal cortex, helps with willpower. Almost everyone I know that meditates regularly sees an increase in their willpower or self-control abilities. It really does work. Meditation. Um, let's see. Yeah, told you about the 11 hours. All right. Oh, one last thing on meditation. Because it does light up your prefrontal cortex, you never want to meditate before you go to bed or else you're going to be up all night and you might have nightmares. That's what happens to me. You want to meditate. The best time is right after you get up and you go pee, um, maybe pop in some contacts, brush your teeth. Then you just want to go cup squat somewhere. You don't have to be all full lotus out. You can just sit in a chair, uh, sit on your bed. You do not want to be lying down. You want to be sitting up. Um, and it's okay if you go to sleep. You won't really go to sleep. You'll just have the head bob. Um, that's totally normal too. So lots of thoughts are going to come up. Just keep focusing on your breath. Start with five minutes. I meditate from anywhere from 11 to 19 minutes a day. 20 minutes is too long. 10 minutes is too short. So every day I pick a number between 11 and 19. I decide it and I go for it. Um, so no meditating before bed because I do want you all to get, get great sleep. All right. So the last thing in my Batman model. Okay, if we think about Batman, right? He was this dude who's really good at using his resources. He built his body up. He's like super ripped. He built a suit. He built a Batmobile. The thing I feel about Batman is that he basically didn't have any special talents, but he just made everything he wanted. He, he left no stone unturned. And that's the way I want you to think about willpower. I want you to think of lots of ways that you can really strengthen and reinforce this prefrontal cortex so that when you ask for your willpower to be on for you, it's on. You're not distracted. Your stress is low. You've been strengthening your willpower muscle. Then the flip side of that is I want you to create routines and habits that lessen your requirement on your willpower. So that's kind of hitting it, like flipping the coin on it and hitting it from the other side is what routines and habits can we set up that take decisions out of the equation and that also align our actions with our deepest goals, desires, and feelings. Um, and that's where I'll kind of leave you. We discussed what we can do here. And on my next webinar, I want to discuss the habits and routines that we can put in place so that we don't always have to rely on our willpower to get us through. All right. That is all I have today. I think I went through it pretty good. We're at 734. Troy just gave me the thumbs up. Um, I want to go ahead and in the comment area, I want you to go ahead and type whether you've ever experienced, experimented with meditation. I'd like to see some yeses and nos. Only in yoga, long time ago. Um, of those of you who said yes, I want to see how many of you are meditating regularly. Just write a no if you're not meditating regularly. And by regularly, I mean every day. Maybe six days a week. We'll say six days a week. Yeah, I feel that's the common theme that I'm seeing, is I feel like there is this big disconnect between, I've done a little bit of it. It didn't really seem very productive. I wasn't sure I was doing it right. Um, so I'm not really doing it anymore. I can say that uh, it's been the biggest game changer for me in my athletics. So I think I'll do a future webinar on it um, just to really go through a ton of different types of meditation because there's a lot you can experiment with. Um, 
but I kind of want to leave you with this message on meditation for you to think about between now and the next time I do a webinar. And that is when you are racing and training, if you look at what pitfalls you're falling into there, into out on the race course, if they have anything to do with someone went by me and I went with them, something went downhill and I couldn't recover. I got to a point in the race where I wasn't going as fast as I wanted to, and I dot, 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 gave up, dot, dot, didn't go kick ass. Anything other than I went and kicked ass. Um, Any time where some impulse comes into the brain and you're not able to manage it properly, quickly, and efficiently to keep yourself on track towards success towards your goal, anytime you get derailed by an internal impulse, that probably means that you need to incorporate a meditation practice into your routine and not leave it all up to the physical swim, bike, run, problem solve, nutrition side of things. So it's kind of um, when I came up with the rising tide idea for my coaching company, and as I have on here, it says a rising tide lifts all boats. That's because I'm about the things that we need to learn and understand and do that will help all of our disciplines in triathlon. And meditation is one of those things. It will help you swim, it'll help your bike, it'll help your run, it'll help your execution of race day. So I'm constantly looking for those things that kind of rise the tide on your triathlon experience. Okay. Are there any questions? Um, there's a couple of ways we can do it. I can take you out of listen only mode and you can um, actually ask it and we can talk back and forth. I think there is a way for you to raise your hand. Let's see, down in the very bottom right corner, bottom right corner, there's a little happy face guy. And in there is a raise hand. Let's see if anyone does it. Troy, do we have any questions that have come through? If we don't have any questions, that means I'm going to start asking you guys questions. Oh, Schaffner. All right, let's see. Now I'm going to figure out how to turn voice on. Schaffner, can you hear me? Oh, hold on. Yes. Oh, hold on. I have to take it into different mode. There we go. All right. Jen, do you have your voice on? There's a little um, audio button underneath the, the movie screen. And it should be green lit up under audio. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you, can talk, you talk a little, little bit about, about light or light, light and, and what, what you do in a race situation? situation? Do you know how in you the swim, you're, you're, you're swimming, swimming and it's it's triggering, triggering uh, fight, uh, or fight or flight? Should yep. we be trying to test that or should we be testing it? Or should we or should we it? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> One thing I hate about Iron Man, and they've kind of toned it down a little bit. I hate to be a hater. I love the Iron Man. But it's like the Eminem playing before the, like, lose yourself in the music, the moment you're going to own it, you know, that goes on before Iron Man. They get you so hyped up. Um, and there's a couple things that happen that I think really derail athletes' chances at a successful Iron Man. I see it time and time again. If you allow yourself to get too hyped up before an Ironman and you go into that massive fight or flight response, you completely change metabolically how you burn fuel. So that's the that's one of the big caveats I see with Ironman athletes who are getting really into it and they're getting really psyched up and, and, and pumped up is they're going into that place where they're turning off that logic side of their brain, which I think we all have seen the first like two miles of the bike. There's like not a lot of logic happening out there. There's a lot of really reactive and primal behavior happening. These people are all in a fight or flight place. And what's happening is they are metabolizing through their carbohydrate and glycogen stores at a lot faster rate than they trained. Um, 
I'd love to see a study on like agroness at the beginning of the bike or the beginning of the swim versus walking the last 10 miles of the run. Cause I think that they probably track together. So yeah, Jen, you really want to suppress your fight or flight before an Ironman. If you're doing an Olympic distance race, that's kind of a different situation. If you're running an 800 on the track all out for time, go to town, man, like thump your chest and pump it up. But I think that Ironman athletes really need to develop into their pre-race routine some sort of grounding and centering process so that they kind of tune out that hype that happens um, in the beginning of the Ironman and that they have a way and method of talking themselves out of tapping into that fight or flight. Because no man in Africa ever ran from a lion for 10 and a half hours. Like it didn't happen, right? We ran antelopes down by just slowly and unexcitedly wearing them out. And that's what Iron Man is. We're just going to slowly and unexcitedly wear everybody else out when we do it successfully. So yeah, I would say you do not want to tap into that fight or flight. Um, one thing that I've done in the past that's really helped is put in earplugs because earplugs were so sensory based. So right, visual, audio um, are really tapped before a race. So earplugs can kind of just dampen and take everything down a notch. Um, I've done that every year in Kona the last three years. I just, I plop those earplugs in because it just, Mike Riley, the Canon, like everyone just takes it down a notch. And then a really good pre-meditation routine that you go through before you race is going to get that prefrontal lobe firing um, on all cylinders. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye, guys. All right. How do I take her out of the words off? Jen, you're still here. I just have to figure out how to take you off. Can I go to Gretchen, do you think? Let's see. I wanted to take Jen off of her. See, she's here. Hold on, Jen. Mm -mm. I think it's here. All right, we have a question um, that came in that Troy just gave me. Give an example or two when during racing, meditation totally paid off. <laughs> okay. This is such a good one. Um, Okay, so I meditated from January all the way to October every day before Kona in 2014. And um, I just considered it, I was just told that it's practicing releasing thoughts. So last year in Kona, we got going and um, we turned on to the Queen K and right away we had this huge headwind and we usually get at least a good 20 miles of tailwind in Kona. And I will tell you like, my inner like oh, kind of started going because that's what happens and i think in the past i would have like just decided that now i had to fight and i had to be tough um that's how i kind of used myself in the past and my skills was like okay this is hard i'm gonna make it i'm gonna be tougher than everything else but what the meditation allowed me to do in that moment is actually to just release that these were the conditions that we were all being dealt with today. And I just released that thought and it came back up. Um, boy, really windy. And I just released the wind again. Oh my gosh, like we're going eight miles an hour at mile you know, 20. Again, I just released that thought and got back to um, what I call working at my best. So when you're meditating, you come back to your breath come back to your breath, come back to your breath. But when you're racing, what you wanna do is replace your breath with what it looks and feels like to compete at your best. So I just kept releasing the wind and coming back to my legs are pistons and my shoulders are relaxed. And then the thought would come up and I'd come right back to my legs are pistons and my, my shoulders are relaxed and my focus is forward and I'm alert. Um, so that's where I was able to catch those thoughts that weren't serving me so much quicker in racing than I ever had been before and were able to just release them. And I was gifted through that process um, later on in the race. I actually had this aha moment, which is what happens when you release thoughts that don't work for you enough times. 
I had this aha moment. Oh my goodness. The universe is giving me this really windy day because it knows that this is what my body and my kind of athlete needs to be at her best. So then I had no more thoughts of wind. I was gifted with the thought that this is actually a gift for me. And if, if I had just kept fighting through the wind, fight, 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 I never would have gotten to that gift of awareness within the race. So Ellen, does that answer your question? Um, you can type yes. We have another one. Um, cut off for 70.3, similar to a full. <laughs> and how long do you meditate before a race? Um, I need more explanation on cut off. Troy wrote cut off for 70.3 question mark. What is the time cut off? Um, it is, what is the time cut off for 70.3? It's half of a full. I think the swim is like 110. Um, and I know in Ironman you have to be off the bike by 5.30 p.m. Um, but I'm not sure what the cutoff is. Usually they have like an overall cutoff. And I feel like it might even be a little bit different from race to race. They don't have any intermediate cutoffs at the 70.3 distance um, that they do at the full distance where you might get cut off at like the 13 mile mark. Um, they don't have those at the 70.3. They're a little more generous, I feel. I hope that answers your question. I have to look that up. Um, you also asked, how long do I meditate before a race? About eight to 10 minutes um, is about all. I just find a little, a little spot and I usually plug my earphones in. I don't even put anything on them. I just plug them in. They get kind of noise canceling. So yeah, eight to 10 minutes, not very long. Um, let's see. Let's see, Gretchen has her hand raised. I'm gonna see if I can turn her on. Mm -hmm. Can I turn Gretchen on, Troy? I'm in Q&A mode. Turn on Gretchen. It helps if you hit the key. There's an ask a question button. There's an ask a question, Gretchen, above um, the attendee details, does it? Yeah. Can you click on that for me? Meanwhile, how would you define the difference between positive thinking and willpower? Ah, uh, positive thinking. Oh, I think they're really different. Um, I think of willpower more around temptation control or getting yourself to do something that is in alignment with your goals when you don't want to do it. So I, a common example is I often have three workouts a day and the third workout I never want to do. Um, so I'm laying there usually in bed cause I'm relaxing and I don't want to go on this third workout. So if I sit there and I'm like, come on, Sonia, you're a great athlete, or this workout is going to go just fine. You've had a ton of them go just fine as the third workout of the day. I, th I think there's this concept in sports that we have this like Pollyanna situation and that we always have to be positive. Um, and there have been studies that I, I should pull some up um, and post them later to the Facebook page, but there have been studies that, that actually just this regurgitation of positive mantra does not enact change unless it's felt deep inside. So there is what comes out our mouth or sort of our conscious, like I'm going to think this. And there's what we feel in our soul about ourselves and the soul always wins. So you can either be in disconnect or you can be in connect between your soul and your words. Um, if you're in disconnect, your soul is still gonna win. So if you don't think you're good enough and you keep saying you're good enough, you're enough, you're good enough, but you really don't think you're good enough, you're going to continue to receive examples of not being good enough until you fix, uh, fix your soul and what you deeply believe, then your words are going to be a natural progression of your beliefs. That's alignment, I would say. And that's different than willpower. Willpower really is tapping into that two brain section that we have, these these two brains that are, one wants to keep us on the couch and one wants to win Hawaii. Um, and Hawaii is a really deep goal, 
but keeping us on the couch is safe. Keeping us on the couch, make sure we don't get injured. Keeping it keeps uh, keeps our body, our physical body, happy. Um, so that's where I really think willpower is different than just pos not just, but positive mantra or positive thought. All right, let's see. Oh, the swim cutoff is 110. Um, this is at Racine. The bike is five hours, 30 minutes after the final wave starts. And the run is eight hours and 30 minutes after the final wave starts. So hope that helps. Let's see. Um, Apollo Ono meditated 20 minutes before he did Kona. I saw it on some coverage. I did not see Apollo meditating before Kona. He probably did it in like a private room sitting with Paula Nubi Frazier. <laughs> but um, that's awesome. He had a really great race. Phenomenal, phenomenal race. Phenomenal athlete. So I, I, I wouldn't doubt it. He's an Olympic champion and um, a lot of Olympians incorporate meditation into their life. Let's see. I never did get Gretchen. Um, let's see a couple more questions if we have. Let's see. What does this say, Troy? Example on some key words to put your running back in place. Okay. So this is about what it looks like and feels like to compete at your best. So when you're out there on the race course or you're in training and you want to practice this in training, this is one of my life, my try hacks. Um, and some of my athletes, they know this one well because I make them go through it a lot. It is so important as a triathlete to have deep, a deep understanding about what it feels like in your body to be at your best. So when you are running and you have one of those magical days or when you're biking or when you're swimming and you're nailing your workout, it is so unbelievably important to go home and write down very specific physical cues. I'm not talking glossy stuff. I am talking the nuts and bolts of what it felt like to be at your best. Um, when I ask athletes, oftentimes, okay, you ran it, you were running, you had this great race, what did it feel like? They're like, oh, it was free. It was, it was, um, I just felt effortless. No, that is not what I'm talking about. Where were your shoulders? Where were your elbows? Where were your knees? Where was your focus? What was your chin doing? How did your toes feel? All of these very anchoring physical cues are what you want to work on um, as you're training for your big race. And then you want to kind of filter them down to two to three words. And then you want to use it in your training. So for me running, it is tall, forward, and what was my other one? Tall, forward, tall, tall, forward, tall forward. There was one more, but I don't, I don't have it anymore. I'll have to redevelop it. Um, so tall forward, that'll be enough bubble. That's what it was. Tall forward bubble. Um, cause I create a bubble around me when I'm running really well. I'm in my little bubble. So tall forward bubble, you want to compress it down to three words and then you want to go into your training session and you've been practicing your meditation. So you, you've been releasing thoughts. And when you have a thought that isn't something you should be thinking and you recognize oops, I'm thinking about work, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. You want to come back to those three words, tall, bubble, forward, tall, bubble, forward. And then you're going to run along with tall, bubble, forward for a while. And then you're going to maybe go into a zone place where you're thinking about nothing. That's cool. You're just going to run with that. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh my gosh, a girl passed me. Oh, she passed me. I'm in fifth. I'm in fifth. Oh gosh, I'm not on the, about to be not on the podium. If I get slower, I'm going to lose the ball. Release. Tall forward bubble, tall forward bubble. So it takes some work. You got to meditate and build the skill there. You got to know what it likes, to, what it feels like to be at your best. You got to build those skills. And then you have to practice them in training because sometimes the words you pick don't work. They don't resonate. What you're really doing is creating an anchor or a hook in your brain to where when you say those three words, your brain remembers what it feels like to be at its best. Um, let's see, we have time for a few more. I really want to respect everyone's time and be done at eight. 
Um, what can I work on this next week to improve my willpower? Two things. One, your grounding. You want to work on that one minute process that you're going to do in your warm up every single session that gets you grounded. So moving your preoccupation thoughts into some other part of your body um, or maybe out your butt. That might work well. Uh, that's one. And then two, you're going to meditate for five minutes each day. Five minutes, set the timer, meditation timer or gong, whatever you want to do, five minutes. Those are the two things you can work on this week. And I guarantee you at the end of this week, your willpower, it will be improved. Maybe this much, maybe this much, but you'll set something in place. All right. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap up so I can get you guys all to bed. We've got just a few minutes left. I have a... Um, I'm going to send out two. I have a little goodie care package of Osmo. I'm going to send out two of these. Um, can you get that book that's on the top shelf there, Troy? I'm going to, send, I'm going to do three giveaways because I just feel like it and I like giving stuff away. And I'm going to give away this book that I just read um, and I think it would be great for triathletes. It's called The Big Leap. All right, so Troy, you're going to go ahead and randomly pick three people who are in attendance today. Drum roll. All right, Troy, give it to me. Naomi Nakamura. Osmo. Another one. Janie Hayes. Osmo! And one more. Leanna Keto. She was a very last minute ad. I had to put her in. Leanna Keto. The big leap. Woohoo! Well, I really want to say thank you, you guys, for showing up and engaging. Um, I hope that this was helpful. I'm probably going to email you guys um, a couple times in the next few days just to let you know where I'm going with this. I'm going to send you guys the recording of this webinar along with anyone else who signed up for the webinar. Um, and any feedback that you guys have for me or things that you want to see me talk about or research or study more um, that excite you. And, and we can go all over the board. Like I've been at this sport for so long. Um, there's really, I can talk all day on a lot of different topics. So if you have an idea for something you'd really just like to get, get my take on, go ahead and, and shoot it over to me um, at my email or respond to any of the messages I send you. I am so ecstatic that all of you guys could attend. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, supporting this and for educating yourself. I look forward to seeing you on the race course in the future. Um, that's it. Over and out.